Hi, my name is Anne Fields Monocle. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of TAF. And this fall, we've partnered with the Grayest, which if you haven't been to their site, they have lots of cool art you can check out and even purchase. So we have Marcy and Chris. Thank you for presenting this and take it away. Thanks for having us. I have known Marcelina for almost 20 years now, and we met in Cincinnati, Ohio. We were both volunteering for Enjoy the Arts. Both of us had either worked or were working for an arts organization. Fast forward 20 years later, here we are. We started The Grayest um, in May of this year. We uh, didn't launch our website until July. Mm. July 1? It was yeah. a very exciting day. <laughs> <laughs> And so the grayest is really designed to help artists who want to spend more time making art and less time marketing with their social presence and just kind of creating an environment where they can bring their questions and concerns and get them aired out in a like-minded community. As it says on the slide, we're a showcase of artists. You know, some of us are just starting out in our craft. Some of us have been doing it for years and years and years. Everything on our site is maker oriented. So it is not repackaged, purchased, pre-manufactured items that are being resold. Everything is handmade by the artist. We want to continue with that as the baseline going forward as we continue to grow. And as part of our overall organization, we want to maintain a level of goodwill. And so each artist donates 5% of their sales to a nonprofit organization of their choosing. In addition, the umbrella organization, The Grayest, donates 5% of our profits every year to a nonprofit organization of our choosing. Marcy, do you have anything to add? Our services, in addition to just marketing stuff, we do strategy, branding, media planning, website design, website creation, maintenance, content creation, artwork, and packaging. But over these last several months, and just responding to our members' needs, coming soon, we're converting the site into a multi-vendor site. So basically, that is a site similar to an Etsy or an Amazon. That's really exciting. And then currently, we're doing an auction with a nonprofit in Cincinnati. Taking the learnings, the lessons that we are uh, experiencing this week with, with the, uh, the auction with the nonprofit. And so that's going to be an everyday feature with our vendors. We're ex definitely expanding. We're hearing uh, what our members want. And so we're responding as, as much as we can. And you can find us in the, all the usual places. <laughs> our website is thegrays.com. And we're on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok. Uh, we're, we haven't utilized all of them yet, since it's just the two of us. We're, we're slowly rolling out into the various uh, social media outlets, but we can be found. We've staked our claim into the social media space. We're most active on Instagram and Facebook right now. And so when we were putting this presentation together, we, we decided to go to the very beginning uh, and assume that uh, our audience didn't know anything about what branding is or how to even work with a designer or an agency or so we decided to go to square one so the topics that we're going to cover today what is branding a brief history of branding why why do we need it uh we'll talk about how to work with a designer and agency what happens behind the scenes what are they doing after we have that initial meeting with them then we'll conclude with customer journey we'll just wrap it up any any questions you may have we'd love to hear them and we'll try and answer them as best as we can just to give you a little bit more on my background, uh, I've been in advertising for 20 years. I do have a, come from a very corporate advertising background. We'll talk a little bit about branding. In 1879, Procter & Gamble trademarked Ivory for their soap brand. And why did they do that? It's because other people were trying to sell soap in markets that they wanted to go into. And they knew they had a quality product. They felt their point of differentiation was that they had very pure ingredients. Ivory soap floats. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember those, the old, old, old commercials, <laughs> but that is their point of differentiation. Ivory, when they trademarked, can we go back? Ivory, when they trademarked, it was important to them as they were starting to ship their stuff to other markets down the river, maybe people who hadn't heard of them, that they were getting the real deal, that they could get repeat customers based on 
this lo logo that they're putting forward. When you're creating a brand, you wanna think about how your customers are distinguishing your product and service from other people in the same category or other brands in the same category. And if you can't identify why your brand is different or why your product or service is different, then I can guarantee you, your customers will not be able to tell you that either. So you need to know your point of differentiation. You might have more than one, but find the key one, the one that really sets you apart. That's the one you wanna focus on. And you need that really to stand out. You need it to be able to charge what you wanna charge, right? If your product is the same as everybody else's product, then it's just a price game. But if your product has a point of differentiation that is important to people, they would be willing to pay a little bit more for it. We were talking earlier about plumbing issues Marcy and I, and are you going to hire a plumber based on price? Or are you going to hire a plumber based on the quality of their work? Or, you know, what is their point of differentiation? Are they really good at sewers? Are they really good at installing brand new plumbing? Are they really good at rehabbing plumbing that's over 100 years old? You're going to pick the plumber that's going to do the job that you need done. It's not going to be a price war. You also wanna engage new customers. If you can tell them why your product is different, they'll be more willing to invest in you initially. And then of course, re of course repeat business. So if they can easily identify your product, you're gonna pick it off the shelf versus another product, they have to go hunting for you. They're not gonna make the effort. People are largely convenience oriented. So if they can easily identify you, great. If they can't, they're probably not gonna look for you. How do you get branding? Branding sounds awesome. I, I want that. How do I get it? First, look at other offerings in the category that you're in. And when you're identifying what makes your product and service unique, how are they identifying what makes their product and service unique? And so you want to position yourself against that. If your thing that you think makes you unique is the same as what everyone else thinks makes them unique, then are you really unique? And if you still feel that you are, how can you position yourself so that a consumer will believe that you are unique? What are you currently doing to distinguish your offering in the customer's mind? These are hard questions. Are you have to think about these things from the perspective of your customers? Maybe you're not right now doing anything to distinguish your offering in the customer's mind. That's okay. You just want to be aware of where you're starting from. What are other people doing to distinguish themselves? Maybe they're not doing anything either. That's okay too, but you don't have to worry about them. <laughs> and then how much are you willing to put behind building your brand? And this is a big question because if you don't have the time or the energy to put behind building your brand, it's good for you to set your expectations around that. You might have other things going on in your life, right? Everyone has other things going on in their life. But when you're starting out to build a business, you have to ask yourself, what are you willing to put into it for the expected return? So we're going to keep asking you that through the series. What are your expectations? What are you willing to put behind it? What do you think success will look like? in the short term and in the long term. My, again, my name is Marcelina Marcy uh, Robledo. Like Chris, I've been in marketing for 20 years. However, I've been on the inside of, a, of an organization. Primarily, I've been within the um, marketing and sales divisions of nonprofits, arts nonprofits. But I've also been in manufacturing, skincare, higher ed, and most recently, professional training. And so together, she and I make a great team because we've been on the opposite end of the marketing spectrum. So basically, I would, I would reach out to agencies to work on projects. So we have the perspective both ends of a, of a particular project. What happens when you work with an agency or designer? There is magic to what they do. <laughs> and, but before they do that, they're going to sit down with you and talk. They're going to sit down with you and they're going to ask you a bunch of questions. They're going to ask open-ended questions such as, what do you do? What is your style? What are your inspirations? Who are your audience? 
Uh, what, it, what are your goals for growth, short and long-term? Do you have examples of your work? What are the limitations? Are you working full-time or part-time on your craft? Do you have a full-time job, full-time family, and you can only spend a couple of hours a week on your particular art? That's all going, going to factor. And do you have a budget? What is your budget like? What is your strategy? How much are you willing to invest in your social media? So all of these questions they're going to ask you, and they do it for a reason, <laughs> because they need to understand you as a person. And they may not take into account the fact that you are a part-time artist, but they're going to understand you. They want to get into your psyche and understand you. We have DIY strategy. This is kind of what you can do, not only to help yourself, but then also when you communicate with, with the agency. This, again, will help in having them understand you and your desires and your business. And so what we're talking about, the DIY strategy, is you're going to create a persona. You're going to create your ideal customer. Who is that person? In fact, um, this morning with our members, we had a meeting and one of our members, she's incredibly talented, but she's always doubting herself. And her audience, she thinks, is just her friends and family, when in fact, we're trying to encourage her to think bigger, think bigger. The world is so much bigger than your, than your friends and family. In doing so, we're encouraging her to, you know, who is her ideal customer? What income level are they? Are they male, female? What age group? Where do they live? She currently lives in Bloomington. Does she want to just serve her local market or does she want to expand? Her ideal customer, are they married? Do they have a lot of free time? Do they have families? Um, are they career oriented? Uh, what motivates them? What type of social life do they have? All of these things matter. Once you understand these questions and you start visualizing who that ideal customer is, now you have somebody to talk to. Now in your head, you have a target, so to speak. And you can have more than one. Probably three, four is a good number of personas to have that you target to. So what happens after you've had the discussion with the agency or the or designer? How do they go about creating your logo and your style and your tone of voice? Essentially your brand. What do they do? How is the sausage made? So the design team, what they're going to do behind closed doors, they're going to do a lot of brainstorming. They're going to take that information. Uh, they're going to sketch, they're going to throw ideas up, and after a while, they're going to self-edit. They probably will come up with 15 to 20 different iterations of sketches, uh, taking keywords that you mentioned. Then they're going to present to you three to five different versions. Upon that meeting, you're going to say, oh, I like version one, but I also like this particular quality of version three. And so in that dialogue, they're, again, they're taking notes. They're going to take what you like and they're going to refer to the information that you gave them initially. And then they're gonna go away for about another week or so. You're gonna come back and then you're gonna pick your favorite of what they've edited for the final time. And that's it. That's pretty much the process in which when you work with a with an agency or designer, it's really fun. <laughs> I love working with agencies because of this process. I love working with them because it just the conversations that happen. Um, I've worked with an agency, a design agency down in Cincinnati twice for two different projects for, for our logo and then also for a logo that I currently contract, a company that I current, currently contract. It's just so much fun. The good agencies and the great designers, they definitely want to serve you and their ego. They put it aside and they are going to give you the best brand that they can. A lot of times people confuse your logo and your website as your brand, but it's not. So part of your brand, it's not your brand. Your brand rather is a culmination of the experience, the perception and reputation people have of your services or your product. So if you think back to the brands that you like, whether it's Dawn Soap or Apple products or Nike tennis shoes, you know, why do you like those? Is it because they just, they're popular 
or do you, as a user, you have good experience with those particular products? I don't have much brand loyalty for many things, but the, the few that I do, I am loyal to the core. Apple being up, Apple products being one of them. Um, early on in my career, I had to work in a situation where I was constantly going back and forth between Apple products and PC products. And that's, that's when I drank the apple juice, <laughs> the proverbial apple juice. Apple products, you know what you're going to get. You know it's expensive, but you know they're going to last. And also branding, I-N-G, the verb, is the actions taken to build your brand, which is the strategy. So there's a lot of planning. Um, and brand identity is the tangible expression of your brand. And that's where the logos, the typography, the colors come into play. And your logo is important because it is your business. It is the, the, the outward expression that you have of your business. So if you think of the Nike swoosh, all you have to do is just look at that little swoosh and you know exactly that that is Nike. The golden arches, you know you're going to get your Big Mac there. <laughs> you can't get your Big Mac anywhere else. Is that the golden arches? That's ultimately the, what, that's your goal. So as you build your businesses, that's how, how you want to um, have people react to you. Five reasons for a logo. You only have one chance to make a good impression. <laughs> Just like when you walk into a room for an interview or for a date, maybe even, uh, you want to put your best foot forward. And so your logo is kind of your best dress suit. And you want to stand away or stand out from your competitors. So you may be among, you may be a photographer and most of your peers are photographers, but what makes you different? You may be a portraiture photographer or you may be a landscape photographer or you may only take photographs of pets. What differentiates you from all of the other photographers in, in your uh, community? It also helps to attract new customers, keep existing ones, and then also facilitates brand loyalty. By golly, whenever I see that little apple, I know what I'm getting. I know where I'm going. It also separates the amateurs from the professionals, the boys and girls from the big kids, from the, from the men and women. And the logo also shows your customers who you are. The elements of logo, color, fonts, and symbols. All of those three elements uh, create your logos. And with warm colors, uh, warm colors induce warm, comfort, energizing, stimulating. Here are just a couple of palettes, color palettes of, of, warm, color, of warm color palettes, excuse me. And here's another one. For cool colors, they often uh, connotate calming, trustworthy, soothing. And here are a couple of color palettes. Cool. Having some technical difficulties here. Here we go. And so this color palette, I put this in intentionally because you see red and you may say, well, Marcy, that's not cool. That's not a cool color palette. When in fact it is, because if you look at this red, even though red typically is a warm color, there's a lot of blue undertones, but then also within this palette, there's dominantly this blue color, um, which will make this color palette a cool color palette. But this red is a cool red because of the blue undertone. So that's just a little thing to keep, a, keep in mind. If you want to use a particular color, you can use that color. There's no reason why you can't use your color. Just understand why, why you want to and where it falls within your color palette. Okay, so fonts. Again, it's another element for your logo. Fonts come in four different flavors. We have serifs, sans serifs, decorative, and uh, handwritten. And so the serifs, the serifs are the type that has the little feet and there it's an older type. And on paper, the little feet will help guide your eye onto the next word. But it really doesn't work that well on, on the screen, on web. So sans serifs are definitely uh, a dominant style or font type that we see today because of the web. 
and because we are constantly looking things on our little mobile phones. Decorative, an example of decorative. We're just gonna skip the hand. <laughs> we all know what script looks like. These logos, these are basically symbols, which we know, again, we're talking about the golden arches. We're re we recognize the golden arches. We recognize the little Best Buy ticket. Your designer, they're going to create a symbol that will be recognizable to your brand. And I would add to this that each one of these logos, when you see it, you know what the company is, and you maybe even have a feeling associated with it, good or bad. And that feeling might change over time, good or bad. McDonald's has probably gone through an evolution over its lifetime because that's what long standing brands do. Long standing brands are like people. When you have a feeling, about a certain brand or company, it's really because they have promised something, right? Ultimately, that is what a brand is. It's a promise. They're saying, I will always have a fizzy, dark colored beverage, sweet beverage for you, Coca-Cola. And they've never broken that promise. They have always delivered consistently. And so that's what you want what is your brand promise and can you deliver it consistently and when you do how will people feel about you think about that when you're developing your brand persona um, your brand's persona and also the persona of your ideal customer how will they feel about you over time and how long will it take for you to get to that point so in, in addition to all the visual stuff within your brand there is a tone of voice um, basically, that is how you verbally communicate with your audience. Do you use friendly language? Are you more rigid and professional in your language? As artists, probably will tend more to a, a friendly tone, as opposed to if you were a lawyer, you want to use language that is much more rigid, much more careful, <laughs> because you're a, you're a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you want to, you want to um, protect your clients through language. Tone of voice plays a, largely into your brand as well as all of the visual components. <laughs> and so your style guide is the instructional document uh, which provides the guidelines and your agency or the designer will provide a style guide for you. So you don't have to remember when I use this or when to use that or can I do this and that and the other or also, as your business grows and you no longer have full control over everything and you outsource that particular task, task to someone else, they now understand what the rules are. And I do have a couple of, a couple of style guides to share with you. And these are just, I just found off the, off the internet, just as examples. But I do have our style guide. So style guides will look very colorful. You're going to have your fonts various um, versions of your of your logo and then this is ours I created this the agency that we worked with they were very gracious in creating the logo for us at gratis and so I didn't want to put the added burden of having them do a style guide when it's something that I could do we'll go ahead and go through the style guide and how we came to our logo, it was really important for Chris and I to have a space where all of our members, are, everything is handcrafted. And so that's where the, um, the handwritten font came into play. And this is actually super unique in that the designer who did this logo, this is their creation. They actually sat down and wrote out the grayest. It was also really important that we communicate that we are a circle, <laughs> a circle of friends, circle of uh, like-minded people, but we also wanted to be inviting. And so this G that they found is very much that of a circle, but with the horizontal line with the G, it looks like the door has been opened. So all of these little components, they are subliminal, but they tell a story. And then our tagline, because art isn't black or white, gray, <laughs> it's where the grayest. But then also in the gray space, that's where creativity happens. That's where the imagination comes into play. They did just a fantastic job on our logo. 
And then the colors, the accent colors, it was really important for us to, to have gender neutral colors. And also you, you can notice on our keywords, gender neutral, community, give back, shades of gray, which is shades of creativity, handmade, unique, inviting. And so I think they did just a fantastic job in communicating that within the logo, as well as the color palette. We also stress that it was very important that our assets be very neutral in terms of not just gender neutrality, but completely as neutral and background and cool as possible, right? Cool color palette. Because the artwork that our members have is so different. And we don't in any way want to compete. We just want to provide a neutral, consistent framework for their art to be showcased. So we don't want to compete with them from an artistic standpoint. We want them to be highlighted. And so that was part of it as well. <clears throat> I do want to bring your attention down to the middle lower half where it says the grayest gallery, marketplace, and auction. So these three sites are the different properties that we're developing. So the grayest gallery is our, is our grayest website now. But as we go in and expand into the marketplace and the auction, I wanted to, just from a practical standpoint, with me going in and out of these, these websites, knowing where the heck am I? <laughs> and so relying on visual cues of where am I, which side am I in? But then also for people who are coming to the sites Again, having those visual cues as to which site are you actually in? Which property are you actually in? And so the marketplace, dominantly the two gray colors with the aqua and then the auction with the gold. And the only reason why I picked those, the gold money, <laughs> it, was just, it was just an association. No other rhyme or reason other, other than that. <laughs> and so, so folks, there's no real hard, hard science. There's just a lot of art and creativity and how you, how you establish your brand. With your style guide comes one more step, and that is the brand kit. And this is where things really, really look at it. If you think of branding sort of as, your, as a wardrobe collection, if you're the house of Gucci or the house of whomever, you know they always have a collection. And so think of your brand kit as the collection of your logo, your fonts, your colors, your graphics, all of those pieces, they come together to create your stationery, um, all of your collateral, everything from your invoice to what you see on your websites, on your social media. It's tying all of that together. And um, I could look at this stuff all day. And I can't wait until I sit and actually create our brand kit. This is where it really gets fun. And this is where you really show off all of the hard work that you have done with your agency or designer, answering out all those open-ended questions, going back and forth and figuring out which is your, which, what your logo is going to look like. This is where it just really comes to life and pops for you. And this is just a brand, brand kit for web design. So you can see the social media icons. And actually, I, this, this reads to me almost like a, a blogger, a, a mom blogger. And so after we had the brand kit, now we have the customer journey. This goes back to the persona that you created before. So you need your persona before you can look at your customer journey. But your customer journey is just a fancy way of projecting out how your persona target customer is going to behave and where you can intersect with them throughout their daily lives. What does your customer do? So let's say you've named your persona. Um, let's say his name is Henry. What does Henry do on an everyday basis? Well, he probably goes online. He maybe works desk job where he has access to the internet during the course of the day. He's probably checking a couple of his favorite websites, um, maybe a news site, a sports site, or a couple sports sites, depending on what Henry does in his free time. Uh, maybe he checks on his kids' website for the school or whatever organization they belong to, calendars, checks his email looks at social media, maybe takes in a few banner ads. He might also interact with traditional media. If he works in an office, maybe there's a TV on all the time in the break room. Uh, maybe he has a radio at his desk. He listens to the radio on his way to work. If he's a commuter, he sees billboard ads on his way to work if he's a commuter or 
Um, if he walks in, he might see some street advertising, street furniture, like phone booths and bench boards. And he probably also gets mail. Those are traditional forms of reaching Henry. Non-traditional ways of reaching Henry are flyers, shopper marketing, and promotions. And then, of course, in person. So if you can get close to Henry or people who Henry knows, you can tell him directly about it. And then there's always word of mouth. Better if someone else tells Henry that you're awesome. You, you can tell Henry you're awesome all day long, but it's better if somebody else tells him that you're awesome. Consistency is the key to building your brand, especially if you have limited resources. I don't know if you remember, but Geico Insurance had several different ad campaigns running at the same time. They had the Geico Gecko, and they also had the Geico Caveman. And those were consecutive campaigns, both targeting different personas. So Geico had identified that they have more than one buyer out there, shopper out there for their products. And so they created campaigns directed to each one of them. That's okay. That's awesome. If you're Geico and you can afford to run two campaigns at the same time with different creative. But I know that for my side gigs, I don't have that kind of budget and I don't have that much energy. Keeping track of two separate campaigns is a lot. <clears throat> just doing one is a lot. I'm sure you know. Just keeping track of if you're doing some online promotion through Facebook, boosting your posts, things like that. It's a lot to keep track of. So doing two of them at the same time, unless you've got a pretty big budget or a lot of time on your hands, it's a lot to manage. Consistency is key. Figure out who your primary persona target is and go after that person. Figure out where they are in the course of their everyday life and how you can intersect with them in those places. Think about how you're defining success. If I want to define success as I'm going to be Bill Gates next week, well, that's a great criteria, but then what do I need to do in order to be Bill Gates next week? And can I do that? And the answer is probably no. Okay, let's reset my expectation. Well, maybe next week I want to sell five more items than I sold this week. Okay, well then what do I have to do to get there? So what are you doing today to get the results you have today? What do you want your results to be next week? And what do you have to do to get there? And then set a further goal out. What's next week? What's next month? Holiday season's coming up. I know a lot of your artists, this might be prime selling time for you. Think about what do you want the holiday season to look like? After that, maybe what do you want the holiday season to look like next year? The graphic that you're looking at now, I took from the internet, sort of gives you a simplified version of the decision-making process. So people don't hear about you once and go, yes, I'm going to buy that. Maybe one or two people will. They'll see your stuff at a farmer's market, at a table or a booth that you have set up at a festival somewhere. They see you, like something, buy it right then. You didn't have to advertise to them. Awesome. But most of the time, you have to generate awareness first. People have to hear about you. They have to be a little bit curious, maybe. Then they have to be in the market, right? So now they're setting a consideration set. Okay, I need to buy laundry detergent. What do I want to think about buying? I could buy Tide. I could buy Purcell. I could buy Gain. Those are the three top contenders in my consideration set. So now I'm going to go, actually, I need laundry detergent. I'm going to do laundry tomorrow. The time has come to make a decision. So I'm going to go to the store where all the laundry detergent is, or I'm going to order it online through Fresh Direct or Amazon or whatever. And I'm going to see what's available. Gain, not available. They're out of my consideration set. So now it's down to the next two. In the customer journey, where are you? How do your customers find you? Are you easily available? And then retention. Once I make the purchase, did this product deliver on its brand promise? It promised to clean my clothes. If it didn't do that, I'm not going to buy it again. If it did do that, okay, I'm probably going to enjoy our interaction and repeat it. And then advocacy, right? That's the holy grail. You want the Marcy's of the world to advocate for Apple products, right? You want people to say, like, 
I use Tide. I love it. It gets my clothes clean. I think you should use Tide. It's great if I tell Henry that my product is awesome, but it's a whole lot better if somebody else tells Henry my product is awesome. And so the different circles on this graphic are points where you can interact with people as they're going through their customer journey to influence their decision, right? Or just to get into that part of the decision-making process. Uh, when it comes to the style guide, which, which I see that being um, a really valuable thing that you could do, but say you're doing art uh, or you're doing, and you're doing merchandise and you have different styles of products within those categories. Like maybe with art, you have a serious series of paintings and then you have some crazy ones. Would, and same with the merchandise. Maybe you do Christmas cards, but yet you also have wacky t-shirts. Do you differentiate within those larger areas, like within your gallery or within your marketplace? Do you then choose colors and fonts for those different categories too? So that's kind of more along the lines of a brand kit. So this is it's more of your brand kit. <clears throat> and so here you can see how your brand sits on all of these different pieces, but they all, you can tell that they all go together because the same colors, the same fonts, uh, the same tone. It, that's the cohesionness of your brand. Okay. Your style guide, on the other hand, this is, this is your owner's manual of your brand. This is gonna tell you uh, when to use certain fonts. So with us, we have two different fonts. We have Futura, Medium, and Open Sans. I only use Futura for headings. And when the end, they're always in cap. And that's it. Everything else I use Open Sans. So this is, this is your, your instruction manual. And also with your colors, if you notice that there are different values of the colors, that's absolutely permissible because it's the same color, just a different value. Like within a gallery, say you have a gallery on your website and you're you're committed to these colors and to the fonts and everything else, um, then I assume you just stay with those for whatever style of art you have. But if you have packaging or signs or labels or something like that, that is where you would go more into the kit where you have a maybe a little different look for different things. Is that what you're saying? Not exactly. So take the example of these three properties that we have, the gallery, the marketplace, and the auction. So presently, the gallery is full-on functioning. And if you were to go there now, thegrayest.com, you're going to see a lot of this aqua. But because we're going to separate into these three different properties, <clears throat> moving forward, the marketplace is going to have that dominant, not the dominant, but the accent of the aqua. The auction site is going to have that accent of the, uh, of the gold and the gallery is going to be all gray. Okay. So, so basically I'm color coding my websites basically. Okay. And I'm doing it for two reasons. One for me as the designer, flipping back and forth to all these sites those are visual cues for me as to which site I'm in. But then you as the visitor, again, it's a visual cue as to which site you are in. And it's very subtle. It's, it functions on a, on a subconscious level, but it works. <laughs> it, just, it, triggers, it triggers you and, and, under, and having an understand, understanding and your awareness okay. as to where you are. And Karen, I would also say that if you're, I think you said in your original question that uh, maybe you're going to have a seasonal thing or something that is a little bit out of character to what you normally produce. Yes. It depends on how consistent you're going to be with that sort of novelty thing. If it's going to be every season, you're going to come up with something that's out of character for your core brand. Right. Then maybe if you're going to be that consistent, you create a side brand. We have the grayest, but also I'm a yoga instructor and right. also I make my own jewelry line. Those things are very separate. I have them under three different logos. I have them under three different, I actually have different social personalities, online social personalities okay. um, for each one. But it's because I know that they're so different from each other and the consistency is going to be there. I'm gonna maintain them long-term. So mm -hmm. if it's something you're gonna do for a season and pop out again and not really do it, then I wouldn't create another 
sort of line for that. Right. But if you are going to keep it as something consistent, then maybe explore the opportunity to to make it its own thing. Okay, I see that. Yeah. All right. Great. Uh, Marcy, we had a question from Duran. Sure. <clears throat> working with an agency will be more expensive than working with an individual designer. Uh, because of the agency, they have overhead, they have a team, whereas a, a solo designer is going to be less expensive. Ballpark, my point of reference is that of Cincinnati. I just moved up to Wolcott from Cincinnati a year ago. So my point of reference is going to be higher. So I, uh, probably a starting point, if you're going to work with an agency, is around four or $5,000. With an individual graphic designer, probably closer to... 2000 2500 for for a graphic designer that's not to say however that you may be able to do some bartering if you have uh, an individual graphic designer that uh, a friend that you can that you can call upon how we were able to get our logo at gratis is that the owner uh he and i uh, i do business consulting for him and so uh, we were able to, I just asked him <laughs> and, he, and he said, yeah, I'll go ahead and do it just because we had that relationship. And he also knew that I had the skills to finish out uh, the, the style guide and so on and so forth. So his team was going to be used minimally. Can I so answer, Marcy? Marcy? Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, uh, Taff, you know, we've been looking at upgrading our website as well as, you know, looking at our logo. And so we did recently search for a, either an agency or a person to work with. And I would say, you know, we saw the low end was about a thousand for like an individual who wanted to take on the project. Um, but we, you know, saw as high as 5,000, you know, if it was a really big group. So I'm sure you can find someone to do it for less. Um, like for instance, I've designed logos, you know, for like 500 bucks, but I'm not, you know, an expert expert by any means. Um, so you can make it work and trades like Marcy was saying are, are, are a great way to go. Marcy says that we got our logo gratis, but I don't consider it gratis because Marcy invests a lot of time and energy with that organization. And it's just a different way of paying. The other thing I would say is this, to go back to our example of the plumber, you get what you pay for in all things. And so if you are looking for a very professional package of like a brand kit, right, you're going to go to someone who has the expertise to put that together for you. You are going to pay more for that. I would put it into a consideration set of what do I want in return? Set your budget based on what your income level is expected to be, right? If I think, okay, next year I am going to quit my job and I'm going to do my art and that is going to sustain me as my full-time income. Does that change how much I'm willing to put into my branding? Or if this is a part-time gig for me now, it's gonna be a part-time gig for me next year and into the next five years. Okay, now what am I willing to put in? And make it a percentage of what you expect your income to be. And the other thing I would say is if you're joining us for the rest of the series or even for the next one, you know, and you want to come back with things like that we've challenged you with, questions that we've asked. What are your expectations? How are you defining success? What's your brand persona? You know, come back with those things to the next session and it'll make the session easier for you in terms of what you want answered. Uh, maybe we can talk about specific examples for each individual person. 